hello to CPAC. We've been coming here a long time, and it's uh, gotten bigger and better and more beautiful. And thank you very much. It's a big election going on today. You probably have read a little bit about it. And I'm supposed to be in a slightly different location, not too far away, but nevertheless, it's different. And I said, no, I'm sorry. I have to be at CPAC today. I have to be there. And I want to thank Matt and Mercedes Schlapp, two great people, along with the entire staff. Thank you very much, Mercedes. Thanks, Matt. The entire staff of the American Conservative Union, that's what it is. It's a conservative union. It's also a union of common sense. I've been saying it more and more. You know, conservative, it's common sense. And I don't know, maybe we'll have to put that, Matt, on the bottom of that. Uh, a group of people with common sense to save our country and make America great again. It's pretty simple, isn't it, huh? We have a tremendous group of dignitaries, leaders, world leaders, and local uh, leaders. But we have, from all over the world, people with us right now at this moment in the room. And you know, I'll just mention a few. President of Argentina, who's gotten a lot of publicity. He's gotten a lot. He's a great gentleman. You know, he's MAGA. He's MAGA. Make Argentina great again. It's true. No, and he said, I am MAGA. And then I realized he's one of the few who can really do it well. Make Argentina great again. Javier Millet. Thank you very much, Javier. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to have him with us. Senator J.D. Vance. He's doing a fantastic job. Thank you, J.D. Congressman Corey Mills. Thank you. A very powerful competitor of mine. He is a quick one. He's a smart one. Vivek. Where is Vivek? Ramishwamy. Thank you. He endorsed me. When he endorsed me, I said, that's a great endorsement. Thank you, Vivek. Former senator and somebody that's been very nice to me over the years. I don't know why, but he has Rick Santorum. Thank you, Rick. Where is Rick? Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Former acting attorney general, somebody that's been very loyal to the administration and to his country, Matt Whitaker. Thank you. Matt, thank you very much. The former chair of my Council of Economic Advisors, Kevin Hassett, with a nice smile, always has that beautiful smile. Somebody that very shortly will be a United States Senator, Carrie Lake. Where is Carrie Lake? Where is Carrie Lake? Wow, that's a pretty good hand you just got, Carrie, I'll tell you. Well, she was very close to being governor, but unfortunately, a lot of the voting machines just didn't work. They weren't working that particular day. The lines were miles long. They weren't working too well that day, Carrie, but it's one of those things. And then the judges said, well, not our fault. Uh, we better straighten out our elections pretty fast, because otherwise, we're not going to have a country any longer. That's true. Thank you, Carrie, very much. U.S. Senate candidate from Virginia, Hung Kao. Whoa, he's got support. He's got some support. Wow. Wow. A man who is tough and smart and loves our country. He's the head of America First Legal. He's won a lot of cases, I can tell you. And he's a real, real guy. He's a real patriot. Stephen Miller, my friend. <laughs> Stephen Miller. He's around here someplace. There's a lot of people in this room. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. President of the Vox Party in Spain, Santiago Abascal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Santiago. Great to meet you. They've made a lot of progress, too. He'll be number two and number one very shortly, it seems like. That's what I'm reading. Let's see if what, you know, a lot of it's fake news, so we can't, uh, we can't go by everything. But that's what I'm hearing. Federal Deputy from Brazil, Eduardo Bolsonaro. Eduardo, wherever you are. North Carolina GOP Chair, and I think he'll be probably going to a, a national position very shortly, Michael 
Watley, fantastic guy. And we all know and love a man who great bravery in the administration, uh, really a brave person. He went through hell and back, and he beat everybody. He just beat them along the way. Rick Grinnell. Thank you, Rick. The president of Moms for America, Kimberly Fletchner. That's a good group. They just gave me their award. They just thank you for that wonderful award. How about Moms for America picks Donald Trump as the man of the year? Can you believe this? Is that have I made progress? Ah, oh, boy. And a man, the greatest, single greatest advertiser and purchaser of advertising in the history of America, Mike Lindell. The greatest. An incredible lawyer, one of the most respected lawyers in the country, John Cole. John, thank you. Thank you, John. And Stephen Moore, we all know, he's uh, got great predictions if Trump wins. If Trump doesn't win, he says it's going to go bad. It's going to go bad fast. Stephen Moore, highly, highly respected economist. Thank you, Stephen. And a man who I've had respect for, for certainly a long time. I won't tell you how long, too long. But somebody that I've listened to over the years, even when he was on CNN. That's when people used to watch CNN a lot. He always, he always had the number one show. He's an incredible. <laughs> they sound booey. <laughs> I agree with you. But he's an incredible guy, an incredible mind, uh, loves our country, and he fights like hell for our country. The great Lou Dobbs. Where's Lou? Thank you, Lou. You look good, Lou. And we have Tom Fitton. We have so many people. Tom Fitton. Where's Tom Fitton? Stand up, Tom Fitton. Stand up, Steve Bannon. Where's Steve Bannon? Where's Steve? Where is Steve? Stand up, Bannon. Where the hell is Bannon? Oh, he still looks good? Tom always looks good. I don't know. I think he does that weightlifting stuff, Tom, right? But Bannon looks good. We love Steve. We love them all. We love them all. We have so many others in the audience, and I want to say hello, but we have to get we have to get down to business because I want to win the award as the best, whatever the hell they call it, the best speaker, I think they say. Who who made the best speech? And if I keep introducing people, I'm not gonna win it this year. I've won it like nine years in a row, right? I got to get going. So thank you, everybody, for being here. We appreciate it very much. We appreciate it very much. Gorka, did I see the Gorka man? Yes, stand up, Gorka. Quick, get up. How good, how good is he, Sebastian? Seb, they call him Seb. I call him Sebastian. Thank you, Sebastian. I just spotted you. It's lucky you're nice and tall. Four years ago, I told you that if crooked Joe Biden got to the White House, our borders would be abolished. Our middle class would be decimated, and our communities would be plagued by bloodshed, chaos, and violent crime. We were right about everything. So believe me when I offer you another warning, and we've been right about so much, just about everything. If crooked Joe Biden and his thugs win in 2024, the worst is yet to come. Our country go will go and sink to levels that were unimaginable. And just think about it. With four more years of Biden, the hordes of illegal aliens stampeding across our borders will exceed 40 to 50 million people. Medicare, Social Security, health care, and public education will buckle and collapse. It will collapse as sure as you're sitting or standing there. It will collapse. Our economy will be starved of energy by Crooked Joe's vindictive Green New Scam. It's a Green New Scam. It'll be the destruction of our country. It is indeed a scam, and most of them know it. Some of them, the fools, believe it, but most of them know it. Millions of manufacturing jobs will be choked off into extinction, and you'll have constant blockouts and blackouts and rampant inflation. Ruthless gangs will explode even more into the suburbs when they talk about 
suburban women, they're going to love me so much. They're going to say, oh, I wish we had that guy back. The gangs will be invading your territory, I can tell you that. While weaponized law enforcement hunts for conservatives and people of faith, religious, Hamas and Antifa will terrorize our streets while they're Brutal ideology, and it is brutal indeed. It is brutal and horrible, like nobody's ever seen before. It takes over our schools. China will dominate us, not just economically, but militarily, and that's what they want, and that's where they're heading. But they weren't heading there with me. I took over $400 billion out of China, and they weren't too happy about it. And then all of a sudden, we had the China virus. Now, I happen to think it was incompetence, but a lot of people disagree with that. And a declining, crooked Joe Biden. He's the crookedest, most incompetent president in the history of our country. <laughs> we'll soon have us losing World War III. We won't even be in World War III. We'll be losing World War III with weapons the likes of which nobody has ever seen before. These are the stakes of this election. Our country is being destroyed, and the only thing standing between you and its obliteration is me. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Victor Orban, somebody I respect greatly. A lot of people respect him. Tough guy, smart guy. He made the statement recently. He said, uh, if you bring back Trump, it'll all stop. They all listened to Trump. They respected Trump. He actually said it stronger than that. He said they were afraid of Trump. I don't want people to be afraid of me. But he said, China was afraid. Russia was afraid. They were all afraid of Trump. Bring him back, and it'll all go back. And I will tell you, uh, we had things at a level that nobody's ever seen before. We had no wars. We had defeated ISIS. We got rid of the worst terrorists in the world. You know that. And solely defeated. We took 100% of ISIS gone. And then we had no wars for four years. We had no wars. First time in 72 years that that happened, no wars. <laughs> Hillary Clinton, during one of our debates, if you remember that, she said, look at him, listen to him. He's going to cause wars. We'll be in wars. No, no. It turned out that I was able to stop wars from happening and brought our troops back home. We got out of these ridiculous, endless wars, killing people on both sides, costing trillions of dollars. Crooked Joe and his henchmen have you trapped, and it's an express train barreling toward servitude and to ruin. It's, uh, it's moving at a speed that Joe doesn't understand, because Joe actually, I don't think he knows what the hell's going on, to be honest with you, but he's surrounded by some very bad fascists. A vote for Trump is your ticket back to freedom. It's your passport out of tyranny. And it's your only escape from Joe Biden and his gang's fast track to hell. And in many ways, we're living in hell right now. Because the fact is, Joe Biden is a threat to democracy. He really is a threat to democracy. I stand before you today not only as your past and hopefully future president, but as a proud political dissident. I am a dissident. Remember this, I've been indicted more than Alphonse Capone, Mr. President. Do you know who that is? Even the President just said, I do. Scarface, Al Capone. If he had dinner with you and he didn't like the smile in your face, he thought you were mocking him by smiling, you would be dead before you got home and said hello to your wife. And Alphonse Capone, I, have, I got indicted four times by this gang of thugs for nothing. Or, as I say respectfully to the people from foreign countries, for bullshit. Thank you, Thank you. Now, it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous what's going on. They've weaponized government. They've weaponized the DOJ, the FBI. Uh, we've never had anything like this in this country. And it's, uh, 
It's a phenomenon that's taken place many times, but in third world countries and in banana republics, not in the United States of America. So it's very dangerous, and they are indeed a threat to democracy. And I'm here to unleash this captive nation from Joe Biden and his gang of very bad people, very sick people, smart people, intelligent people, but they're hell-bent on the destruction of American freedom. It's happening in our country, and it's so obvious. I have people come to see me from other lands where this has gone on, especially in South America, Latin America, and they'll say, uh, the same thing happened to my country 20 years ago. It was the same thing. It's all happening, and if we don't stop it, this is it. 2024. If we don't stop it, this is our last train. If we don't stop it, we're going to have a country. It won't even be a country. You want to know the truth? It won't even be a country. It's breaking out. If we can break out of the Biden nightmare, and it is a nightmare, he's the most incompetent person. Can you imagine this man who can't walk off a stage? He can't find the stairs. Where are they? Where are they, he asks. Where? He makes a two-minute speech because that's about the only they couldn't get any more fuel than that. <laughs> Whatever happened to the cocaine they found in the White House? <laughs> Where is it? And by the way, I have to say, because I have such respect for this audience and CPAC, I would have never spoken and I never did about him because of my respect for the officer the president. I have great respect for that office. But once I got indicted the first time, remember that? I got indicted, and I got impeached twice. We won that, and we'll win all of this stuff. But once I got indicted, I said, well, now the gloves have to come off because they did something. Those, you know, the fake news, before these indictments came, the fake news, almost every one of well, he'll never be indicted. You don't do that. He was a very popular president. You know, I got more votes than any sitting president in history. I got almost 75 million votes. <laughs> Substantially more than any other president, sitting president, has gotten. And they would say, oh, no, he'll never be indicted. These are people that some of them truly have Trump derangement syndrome. And they were saying, he'll never be indicted. They won't do that. They'll never. He did it. They did it. They actually. And it was all done by him in order to go after your political opponent so that you can damage him enough that you can maybe win. But it's had the reverse effect, because our poll numbers have gone through the roof. Can you believe this? They've gone through the roof. That wasn't supposed to happen, and it's probably never happened before. I've watched over the years as politicians get indicted, and they start by going to a microphone about two minutes after it happened. Ladies and gentlemen, I will be resigning from office today, and I will be home, go home with my family and my friends, and I will fight for my name. Well, that's the last you ever hear from that poor guy. And with me, we have a big voice. We have, you can see by this crowd today, look at that, standing room only, they're all over the place. They have three rooms like this. That are and I have a voice that I can explain it all, like the laptop from hell when they impeached me. And it turned out I was right after going through all that. And now they say, you know, we shouldn't have impeached him. He was right because the laptop from hell showed that I was 100 percent right. All of these things, we were right on all of it. But we're in a very bad path. We're, it's a very, very dangerous path that we are on as a country because the other, the other side, which I find tends to be a much nicer group of people, and maybe foolishly so, but the other side can also get nasty. And at some point, they probably will have to do that because we cannot let this weaponization go on against the Republican Party, against religion, against conservatives. We cannot let this continue to happen. So if we can break out of this Biden nightmare, we're, it's a nightmare. Our country is no longer respected. We're laughed at all over the world. We have to break out of the nightmare that we're in. And we have it in the grasp to make America richer and safer and stronger and prouder and more beautiful than ever before. I think we have a final shot at it. But if we don't do well in this next election, or if they cheat enough that they can steal it, which is, I think, the only way they can win, who the hell can win when you have 16 million people pouring into our country 
from places unknown. We have no countries that nobody ever even heard of from all over the world. Yesterday, they had many people caught from prisons in, you remember this, right? Prisons in the Congo. Let me tell you, the only good thing is they make our prisoners and our bad gang members look like very nice people by comparison. That's the one good thing. All of a sudden, we're starting to like our prisoners and our horrible, violent criminals because they're nicer than the people that are flowing in. They're coming from Asia. They're coming from the Middle East. They're coming from all over the world, coming from Africa. And we're not going to stand for it anymore as a country. We're not going to stand for it anymore. They're destroying our country. And we built five, think of it. We had the safest border three years ago. We had the safest border in the history of our country. Now we have the worst border in the history of the world. There's never been a country ever, third world countries. They've never been like this. They would have fought with sticks and stones. They didn't need rifles. We have the best in the world, but we let everyone, because we're fools. Either they want to destroy our country or they're stupid. And I don't think they're stupid because anybody that can cheat on elections like they do is not stupid. That means they want to destroy our country. But who can win an election when you have that? Who can win an election when you have high interest rates, you can't buy a home, where you have bad education, where everything's woke? We did things that nobody can imagine. So many things, a thousand elements we did. We have a book, this, the thousand things. We did things that nobody could even imagine. And then all of a sudden, something very bad happened. Israel would have never happened. The attack on Israel would have never happened. Remember, Iran was broke. They were broke. Ukraine would have never happened. I talked to Putin a lot. I got along with him well. Although he did announce the other day that he'd much rather see Biden as president. And I agree with him. I agree. Because, you know, I ended Nord Stream, right? I ended Nord Stream. Nobody ever heard of Nord Stream 2. That's the biggest pipeline in the world. Going into Germany, what's that all about? We defend Germany and Europe, and then they go and pay billions of dollars to the people that we're defending them against. How do you figure that one, right? And I stopped it. It was over. And then Biden comes in, and within three days, he approves Nord Stream. But he kills Keystone Pipeline, right? He kills Keystone. He approves the Russian pipeline, the biggest in the world. Billions and billions of dollars a month come flowing in. But he ends the Keystone XL pipeline. And then they say, Trump is too nice to Russia. I'm nice. I'm the one that gave him the 100 javelins, the thousands of javelins that knocked out the tanks. But they knocked out 100 tanks in the first two days with javelins that I gave. Remember, they said, Obama gave pillows, and Trump gave javelins. And then they say, oh, Trump is so nice to Russia. Putin would say, if you're being nice, I hate like hell to think of what you'd be if you were not nice. But we were tough, and we were smart, and we were right. We were right just on everything. We were right. And what they've done is unthinkable. What they did with the border, allowing these people to flow in, is unbelievable. But to achieve a great future, we first have to throw off the chains of our out-of-control political class, and that begins with telling Crooked Joe Biden, you remember The Apprentice? Crooked Joe Biden, you're fired. Get out of here. Get the hell. You're, des you're destroying our country. You're fired, Biden. Get the hell out of here. Right? Get the hell out of here, this guy. He goes after his political opponents. Let's go after them. See if you can indict them so that maybe we can win. A little bit of a backlash when the numbers go up. But anybody that does that and all these other things they've done, they're destroying our country. We're not respected anywhere anymore. We're laughed at. We've become a joke as a country. For years, you've watched as the entire Washington cesspool has been feeding on the wealth and hopes and dreams of hardworking Americans, really hardworking Americans. They've feasted on the Profits of job-killing trade deals. They've gorged themselves on the spoils of endless wars. 
And now what they crave, they want it so badly, is permanent political power and dominance for whatever reason. They're sickos, that's why. In 2016, we gave these corrupt insiders their chance to change, and with Biden, they answered with hoaxes and witch hunts, censorship, lockdowns, and with total repression. Eight years later, the swamp has rejected your righteous pleas to reform, and we have to do this, and we're going to reform, and we're going to have freedom again. We're going to have freedom again. We do not have freedom, and we have the most corrupt press anywhere. These people are corrupt. They are corrupt. Not all of them. About 92 percent. No, you have some wonderful journalists. You really do. But you have — they're just overwhelmed by the people that know they're doing so wrong. I watch ABC, CBS, NBC. I mean, it's so — I don't even talk about CNN because nobody watches them anymore. MSDNC. MSDNC is horrible, horrible. But fortunately, not a lot of people are watching them anymore. They've, they've tuned out. But the press has to straighten itself out. You know, they're all doing badly, and they're doing badly because they're fake news. That was another one we called, right? Fake news. The only problem with that term, it's not strong enough. I wish it was stronger. At the ballot box this November, it's you and the people. You have to be, and we'll deliver a reckoning like they haven't even imagined before. We're going to straighten out our country. We're going to bring our country back. For hardworking Americans, November 5th will be our new Liberation Day. But for the liars and cheaters and fraudsters and censors and imposters who have commandeered our government, it will be their Judgment Day. Their Judgment Day. When we win, the curtain closes on their corrupt reign, and the sun rises on a bright new future for America. That's what we have to have. I believe it's our last chance. You know, I used to say how important in 2016, if you got to do it, it's the most important election. I meant it, but that was nothing compared to where we are now. What, you know, we had a big border problem, and I solved it. So much so that in 2020, I couldn't even mention it. I'd say, let's talk about the border. Sir, you've solved that problem. You don't have a border. I don't care. I want to talk about the border. I talk about the border. Everybody would sit there. They wouldn't even say anything because we had no problem. I solved it. But who would have thought that now we have a border problem that's 20 times worse than what we had in 2016? 20 times. And we'll solve that one, too. But it's going to have to be very strong action. It's going to have to happen fast before our country is just totally overwhelmed. Your victory will be our ultimate vindication. Your liberty will be our ultimate reward, and the unprecedented success of the United States of America will be my ultimate and absolute revenge. That's what I want. Success will be our revenge. I love those young people over there. But have you seen, the closer we get to this magnificent liberation of our country, the more desperate the Biden regime's evil persecution against us has become. They become more and more violent. The Stalinist show trials being carried out at the Joe Biden orders set fire not only to our system of government, but to hundreds of years of Western legal tradition. You see what's happening. They've replaced law precedent and due process with a rabid mob of radical left Democrat partisans masquerading as judges and juries and prosecutors and executioners. That's what they are. I've gone through trials. The level of hatred from these judges, there's no way you get fair trials. The level of hatred from prosecutors, when they know you've done nothing wrong, it's sick. These are sick people. The only crime I've ever committed is defending America and those who want to destroy it. I will fight those who want to destroy it. And they're very angry at me because I won an election that wasn't supposed to happen, and they were caught off guard. And they said, we'll never let that happen again. 
And in 2020, they cheated like dogs, and we all know it. We all know it. For that and that alone, Biden and his deranged prosecutors, attorney generals, local district attorneys are trying to take away my liberty. They're trying to take it away. They're trying to steal my liberty. If there's any shred of justice left, they will fail, and we will win. And so far, we're doing very nicely. Thank you. But I would rather lose my freedom than surrender to this group of thugs and tyrants, fascists, scoundrels, and rogues. The more the corrupt establishment tries to stop us, the more you know the day is near at hand when we will break free from their grip. We're going to break free very soon. We're going to break free from their grip very soon. You heard the J6 hostages, didn't you? You heard that. And uh, I will tell you, there's never been in the history of our country a group of people treated the way they've been treated. There's never been anything like it. Carpenters, mechanics, lawyers, firemen, policemen, military people. They went to protest a rigged election, and they've been sentenced to years in prison. When they burn down Portland and they take over a vast section of Seattle and they burn down Minneapolis, and I had to watch television as a CNN reporter is standing saying, this is a peaceful protest. I'd like to see. This is a peaceful protest. And the whole damn city behind them is burning to the ground. Did you remember that? The, as far as the eye could see, Minneapolis burning to the ground. And this is a peaceful protest. And then he got hit on the knee, and he went down. It was crazy. No, it's crazy what's going on. And if I, I tell you what, if I didn't bring in the National Guard, because the governor didn't want to do it, they'd never want to do it. If I didn't bring in the National Guard, I wish I didn't wait six days, but if I didn't bring in the National Guard, you wouldn't even have, have a city there. You wouldn't even have. That city was going down. They'll only motivate us more to make America great again. We have to make America great again. That's our mission. People say, what is your mission, sir? I remember when Ted Kennedy, he was actually a friend of mine, slightly different viewpoint on life, but he was a friend. But they asked him a question. He took him down. What plans do you have for America? Why are you running? And somehow, you know, that's a much harder question than you think because, you know, you're answering all the little details. Then they ask, what are your plans for America? I took him down. I actually took him down. I just say, my plans are very simple. Make America great again. That's all I say. Make America great again. Very simple. Thank you, Gordon. The first and most urgent action when we win will be the sealing of the border, stopping the invasion, drill, baby, drill, send Joe Biden's illegal aliens back home. We'll do all of, all of those things, and we're going to have to do them fast, because no country can sustain what's happening in our country. You look at New York, where I originally came from. I love New York. And you take a look at what's happening. Hundreds of thousands of people, they've taken over the streets, Madison Avenue. They've taken over Queens. They've taken over Brooklyn and the Bronx. They've taken over the whole city. The little leaguers can't play anymore because people are there that can't play. But it took longer than I thought, but I predicted this. It's called the migrant crime, and it's far more deadly than anybody thought. They will actually have fistfights with police in the middle of the street. You saw that the other day, where they attacked police. Even our bad criminals, they never had fistfights with a cop. You know, they do things, and they talk, and they shout. But these guys are actually — and you know the interesting thing? In their country, if they ever did that, they'd be dead within seconds. They'd be dead. I know where they come from. I know the people that run those countries. I know the presidents and the dictators. I know every one of them. Some are dictators, some are prime ministers. But they're tough guys. They're tough guys. And those thugs that gave the middle finger to our police and then started fighting them and actually threw two of them down and started beating the hell out of them, although they fought back bravely, the two, 
but these are tough people, and uh, they know that in their country, they'd be dead within minutes. They would be dead as a doornail within minutes. And so they came over here. So it took a long time, but now it's talking. Now you're seeing it. It's migrant crime. It's a new category of crime. And I wanted to call it Biden migrant crime, but it's too long. <laughs> so we just call it migrant crime. We have a new category, migrant crime, and it's going to be more severe than violent crime and crime as we knew it, because we have millions and millions of people, and they came from prisons and jails. They came from mental institutions and insane asylums. No, they're not the same thing. An insane asylum is a mental institution on steroids, okay? It's uh, silence of the lambs, okay? You know that. Hannibal Lecter, they're all being deposited into our country, and then you have terrorists, and then you have drugs, and then you have human traffickers, and they're coming over at levels never seen before. We've never seen anything like this. Three years ago, we had the safest and most secure border in U.S. history. We ended catch and release, except when it was catch and release in Mexico. We had catch and release in our country. We built 571 miles of border wall, far more than I said I was going to build. And I couldn't get the damn thing <laughs> through Paul Ryan. He stopped at Paul Ryan, a super rhino. He's a super rhino. I couldn't get it through Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell. They said, sir, if you wait till next year. I said, you sure? They said, don't forget, I had never done this stuff before. You know, I'm, still, I'm the president, and these guys are bullshitting me. They said, sir, if you would just sign this budget, and wait, next year we'll put it. And then next year came. I said, where's my wall? They said, sir, we're not going to be able to. You're not going to be able to get it. You know, in the meantime, they give trillions of dollars to the Democrats for the Green News scam. So what I did is I approved the military, and I took it out of the military. That's how I built it. I built the wall through the military. And the military, by the way, the Army Corps of Engineers did a great job. But I built it through 571 miles and 200 miles ready to go. It was laying there ready to be installed. It would have been three weeks. The entire thing would have been double what I promised. And then we had the rigged election, and they said, we don't want to build the wall. We don't want to build it. And I said, you know, they really do want open walls. I figured it was maybe just talk. I said, they really want an open border. Nobody could understand it. They really want an open border. And that's when it began. And that's when our country had really, because we can look. We can drill. We have more energy. We have more liquid gold than any other country. We can drill. We can do all of these things. But we have a problem because we have, by the time this guy, trying to be nice, but I don't have to be nice anymore because he indicted me. <laughs> but I'm trying to be nice anyway. But by the time this guy gets out of office, we'll have 18 million people, in my opinion, in our country that shouldn't be here. And they do come from prisons and mental institutions, and they are terrorists. And we're going to be paying a price, and it will be the largest deportation in the history of our country. And we have no, we have no choice. And it's not a nice thing to say, and I hate to say it. And those clowns in the media will say, oh, he's so mean. He said, no, no, they're killing our people. They're killing our country. They're killing our people. We have no choice. You know, when I went to Mexico, I said, uh, Mr. President, you're going to have to give us 28,000 soldiers because the caravans. That was another name I came up with. I come up with good names. Okay? <laughs> Long-time politicians come to see me. Sir, could you give an name to my opponent. I said, how long are you a politician? 28 years, sir. You can't come up with your own names, but I do. <laughs> Caravan. But I went to the president of Mexico. I said, they're coming through your country, and thousands and thousands of people in these caravans. They have one coming up now, supposedly 25,000 people. They're going to walk right into our country. We have no idea who the hell they are. But it started with Honduras. It started with El Salvador. They, they just started. But now it's, it's, it's we're equal opportunity. We have everything. We have countries that, honestly, nobody ever has ever heard of. We have languages coming into our country. We don't have one instructor in our entire nation that can speak that language. These are languages. It's the craziest thing. They have languages that nobody in this country has ever heard of. It's a very 
horrible thing. I said to the president of Mexico, you're going to have to give us 28,000 soldiers free of charge. No, 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 Donald, I will not do that. I will not do that. I cannot do that. And I said, no, no, you will. You will, I promise. Are you going to do it? No, 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 I will not do it. I said, listen, you and I, friends, I really like them a lot. So I said, listen, not you and I. Just give me a negotiator, because I don't want to do this with you. And uh, I said, I will do that. And he sent me this very handsome guy, very guy, so handsome, so beautifully dressed. In fact, I asked him for the name of his tailor. <laughs> then when I found out how much he paid for the suit, I said, forget it, keep it. But he was a handsome devil. And I said, listen, you're going to have to do a few things. You're going to have to give me 28,000 soldiers. You know, Tom Holman was up before. He's fantastic. When and, and he does go around saying, I love this guy. He says, Trump was the greatest president in history. And on the border, there has never been in his lifetime any president that was even close. And he's right about that. He's right. I mean, we know the results. But Brandon Judd, you have unbelievable people. All they had to do was leave it alone. But I said, you have to give us 28,000 soldiers. No. Then the new guy comes in, the representative. He says, yes, sir. Uh, what can I do? Now, I asked Tom Holman, Brandon Judd, and a person from the State Department, a wonderful woman. She's been there for over 20 years. She's covered, Me she covered Mexico for over 20 years. She knew it. Like, and she was competent. She was good. She wasn't a good negotiator. And I said, what would you like? Give me your top. I want a top 10 list. Well, sir, we'd like to remain in Mexico, but we've been trying to get that for years. You won't be able to get that, and you won't be able to get a catch and release in Mexico. You know, we have catch and release, and we catch a criminal, and we release him in our country. I said, no, no. Catch and release is fine in Mexico. Title 42, I want. That's with the sick people and with the children. You've got to get the children back to their parents. All of these things, they gave me a list. But they thought they were wasting time. It was a list of 10 things, tough, tough things. Just ask Tijuana if they were tough. Tijuana became one of the largest cities in the world all of a sudden. They said, what the hell is going on? So this guy comes in, and I say, look, Number one, I want 28,000 soldiers free of charge. And he goes, oh, we're not going to do that. We're not doing it. He thought I was crazy, by the way. I said, oh, no, you're going to do it, 100%. No, no, we're not going to do it. I said, you're going to do it. I guarantee you, you're going to do it. He goes, no way. I said, way. <laughs> and he said, we will not do that, sir. We will not do that. I said, here's what else you're going to do. Remain in Mexico. Nobody comes into our country until they're checked at the border. You're going to do a remain in Mexico. You're going to do catch and release into Mexico, not into our country. You're going to do all sorts of things. You know, we had a lot of medical problems. People were coming in deathly sick with very — with a disease, highly contagious disease. I said, I don't want our people catching these diseases that we never even heard about. They have diseases nobody's ever even heard about. I'm sorry. I feel badly for the people, but we don't want to have this contagion in our country. I'm sorry. And we did that. So we had a list of these 10 things, one tougher than the next. And he said, we're not even going to think about this. And the person from the State Department, this really good woman, but she said, sir, you're just going to be wasting your time. And I said, all right. I said, I'll make you a little bet. I'll bet you I get all 10 within minutes. And she thought I was crazy, too. So after he said, uh, no way, I said, way. And then I said, here is what's going to happen. If you don't approve this and if you don't give us those soldiers, and their soldiers are not politically correct. You know, our soldiers, if you say, excuse me, madam, you're not supposed to be entering our country. Ma'am, please don't enter our country. Then they get indicted because they talk to it too rough, you know. We have the greatest soldiers in the world, but they're not allowed to do their job. I proved that with ISIS. Our soldiers knocked the hell out of ISIS once I took over and took it away from our fake television generals. We have great generals, but not the ones like Millie and these guys on television. They're fake. I had generals that were really tough. I had generals that I had to hold back, okay? We have great military, and it's only woke at the top. I don't think it could ever be wokenized at the lower levels, because these are great people, tough people. I really don't believe they could do it. It was only at the top. And remember, when I let them go, four weeks. We were told four years, and it probably can't be done. I knocked it out in four weeks. 
Our military is great. I said to one of the generals, what's your name? Kane, sir, my name is Kane. He looked better than any movie actor you could get. My name is Kane, sir. I said, all right, Kane, what's your first name? They call me Raisin. I said, what? Raisin, sir. Your name is Raisin Kane? Yes, sir. I love you. You're the man I'm looking for. You're the man I'm looking for. And I said, why is ISIS so tough? He said, they're not tough, sir. They just don't let us do our job. I said, why not? He said, because this is after I flew to Iraq. You know, I flew to Iraq in a plane. Some of you know the story. It was all dark after spending 20 years and a trillion dollars. We can't turn the lights on in a plane. I sat with the pilots, the most handsome human beings I've ever seen. It's not my thing, but they're handsome. <laughs> not my thing. Not even a little bit, but they are handsome. Central casting. Better looking than Tom Cruise and taller. Okay, that's true. So, I'll deviate from the story. Now, by the way, when I deviate, they'll say, oh, he went from, no, no, a really smart person can go through various stories, always come back and conclude everything. Okay. Don't worry, we'll get back to the, we'll get back to Mexico. But this is almost, right now, this is more exciting. <laughs> so the planes are off. I said, why are you doing that? Because, sir, we're flying over an area that's very dangerous, where we spent 20 years eradicating. And so I said, I want to go sit with the pilots, because I often do that. And I'm sitting with the pilots, and I get up there. I'm feeling my way up. And the plane was absolutely dark. No lights on the outside, no lights on the inside. It was, it was a little spooky to wear up there. 40,000 feet getting ready to start going down, and they're telling us we can't have any lights, no lights, no lights in your cabin, sir. And then they pull down the shades anyway. So I'm sort of feeling my way. I get up there, and I see this captain with the crew cut. The whole deal he's got. Yes, sir. It's an honor to be with you, sir. And I said, Captain, I don't see any lights. You know, we're getting close. I said, Is there a problem out there, Captain? No, sir. We'll be landing in. Less than 30 minutes, sir. I say, all right. And I'm sitting in a seat that's right in the back between these two handsome human beings. And you know, they always give, they always give the best pilots, Air Force One and Marine One, the helicopters, you can, which is good. One thing you know, one thing you know, you got great pilots. They, these are the best. And so he said, no problem, sir. We'll be landing in a little while. And then, 10 minutes go by, 15 minutes. I haven't seen one light. There's nothing. It's sad. And I'm getting a little nervous. You know, have you ever seen? <laughs> I'm trying to act cool as a cucumber. And it's, uh, if you know anything about planes, you have the computer. I call it the computer voice. It's the most beautiful voice. If I had that voice, I would have been president 20 years earlier. But the most beautiful voice, so professional. 1,000. That means you're 1,000 feet over the ground. Now, I haven't seen a light. I haven't seen anything. It's just dead. There's not anything. That means we're, like, really low. We have this massive plane. We're just right off the ground. Then it goes 900, 800, 700, 600. Now, we're 600 feet off the ground. We're flying in. The plane is dark, with the exception of a tiny little light that they've got on their dashboard underneath everything and totally concealed. There's not a light anywhere. I've never seen anything. It was like dark. 500. I said, to Captain, <coughs> are we OK, Captain? Everything fine? Yes, sir. No problem. We'll be on the ground in just a few minutes, sir. I say, what ground? So 400, 300, 200. Captain, are we OK? Yes, sir. We'll be landing momentarily, sir. 100. Now, usually when you're in these planes, I do it a lot. You have lights bursting, you know, burst big lights. You've got a runway that's lit up like a candle. There's not one light. There's not even a little, what they call a pigeon light. That's a tiny little light. 100. And I want to ask him again, but 
I want to show some bravery. Because I thought we were going down for the count. And then all of a sudden, and I'm, it's genius. There is no light. And then all of a sudden, 100, and then bing, bing. Beautiful landing like nothing to it. Sir, it was an honor to be with you today, sir. Thank you, Captain. Does anybody have a towel? I'm saying, does anybody have a towel? I need a towel. So now I'm, I'm walking out and getting ready to go down and meet the generals in Iraq to find out why we're not defeating ISIS. And I see my staff, and I, I say, that was quite an experience I just had. Yes, sir. I had a great landing. They said, yeah, well, just. And I said, let me ask you a question. Is the President of the United States allowed to give himself the Congressional Medal of Honor for bravery? Because I did a very brave thing. I was very brave. I was so brave. Am I allowed to do it? And they said, sir, it would not be a good thing to do. Now, here's the problem with that story. The fake news media will lead to more. Donald Trump wanted to give himself the Congressional Medal of Honor. It's true. It's true. When I imitate Biden, who can't find the stairs ever. You know, you have so many stairs in there. You got one there, you got ramps, you got everything. Here, you only have two or three stairs. Sometimes you have six, seven stairs. The craziest thing, what a waste of money. My father would say, what the hell are they doing? All you need is one stair. But for Biden, you need many. But when I imitate him with the stairs, because he never can find his way up. You ever see Secret Service runs up and grabs him and, you know, helps him off the stairs? This is what we have negotiating nuclear weapons. So he finishes his speech, and he do you ever notice? He always finishes it. The speeches last about, would you say, average two, three minutes, right? Very quick. They're very quick and not good. Not good. But the press gives him good marks. I remember when he made such a bad State of the Union speech. Everything was stumbling, mumbling. He didn't know what the hell he was doing. And I said, I'm going to watch CNN, MSDNC to find out what they say, because that was one of the worst speeches. They said, not since FDR has there been a speech so magnificently delivered. I'm telling you, I've never, ever forgotten it. Not since FDR. I said, it's impossible. They're just, they're fake. They're, they're terrible. But you know what? When he goes, and, and he always points. He goes like this. Thank you. <laughs> Where am I? Thank you. And then he goes. <laughs> and he points. You ever notice? And it's always he ends up going in the opposite direction, ultimately. <laughs> but he goes, and then, But if there's a wall behind him, he ends up walking into the wall. <laughs> and then one of these incredible guys from Secret Service, all these beautiful guys, they run up stage. Look at these guys, like central casting, right? They'll run up stage, they'll grab him, and they're not meant to smile. You know, they're very hard lines. When I tell stories, they, they like to smile. I guess they're trained that way. They never smile. You say, good morning. Good morning, sir. They actually turn away. It, it's good. This way, you don't have to say good morning all the time, okay? It's, no, they train him. But so one of these guys will run up and grab him and take him off the stage. This is what we have as our president. But the worst thing is when I do that, the fake news, I call up my wife, our great first lady. She was a great person. People love her. Yeah, people love her. Oh, look at that. Wow. Mercedes, that's pretty good. She's good. And she loves our country, and she loves the people. It's true. When I give these big rallies, we give rallies, they say, we love our First Lady. They have signs, we love her. They always show a high heel, you know? But we love our First Lady. But I call up our First Lady, I say, so, baby, how good was that? She goes, you were OK. She's a very tough critic. I'll go into a group, I'll speak in front of 55, 56, 68,000 people sometimes. I'll call her up, I'll say, how good was I tonight? Was that unbelievable? She goes, well, your hair didn't look good. Oh, <laughs> that's not good. But it's very hard to get like, you know, once in a while she goes, you were really good tonight, but that's like a major. 
But, but I said, in this case, I said, how good was that tonight? She said, you were really good tonight, but what happened? You couldn't find your way off the stage. <laughs> because the fake news said Donald Trump couldn't find his way off the stage. I said, wow. Or when I interject a name, like I go, our president, Barack Hussein Obama, Rush Limbaugh, remember? He would always, right, Seb? Rush would go, Barack Hussein. You couldn't hear Barack or Obama, but the name Hussein, he'd be screaming. I don't know exactly what he meant by that. I think I do. But he'd go, Barack Hussein. So I'd go, Barack Hussein Obama, our president has done this, this. Now, I meant that because there are those people that say he's running our country because Joe is not strong on aptitude. So there are those. We don't know that that's true. But they go out and they say, Donald Trump, headline. Donald Trump doesn't know who the president of our country. He thinks Obama is the president, Lou. Hey, look at the great Lou Dobbs. He thinks Obama is the president. So when I'm sarcastic, because I'm sort of a sarcastic guy, I find humor and sarcasm, but it's very dangerous to do because they take it very seriously. But it's a very serious subject because of what happened. To finish the first story, what happened? <laughs> hey, by the way, isn't this better than reading off a frickin' teleprompter? Right? Right? Anybody can do that except, except for Biden. Anybody can read off a teleprompter except for Biden. He can't do that either. He can't do that either. He asked questions. Uh, news conference. Hey, when I'm in a news conference, people are these, these maniacs, these lunatics are screaming at me. They're just screaming like crazy. And you know, you take them, and I love it. You know, it was like a mental challenge of horrible people. But they're screaming, and you're answering, and you're getting them. And then sometimes they get in trouble because they said, you were too tough, you were too nasty, too this, the people don't like that. And I understand that, too. But he asks, like, a question, and it's, uh, Bob from NBC. Okay. Uh, Mr. President, sir, uh, we just wanted to know, are you feeling well and was everything good? And did you have ice cream today? <laughs> then he picks up the paper and he reads the answer. Yes, it was vanilla. No, but think. They ask him questions, and they give him an answer. That never happened to me, right? I walk out there, and it's like a free-for-all. But it's a, it's a sad thing. OK. So now I go up, and it's what? You know this is all genius, OK? You do know. I hope you do. I always say, my uncle was the longest-serving professor in the history of MIT, Dr. John Trump. We have a lot of great aptitude. They'll say, he rambled. Nobody can ramble like this. Nobody. <laughs> if they did, they'd be, they, they wouldn't even try. You know what? They go step by step, and they would never get off that sucker. They go step by step. But what happens, and it's very interesting, we get on the plane, we get off. Now we're, I've just learned that I should not give myself the Congressional Medal of Honor. My people <laughs> are saying, can you believe he asked that question? But we get off the plane, and I'm walking down. I'm going down this big ramp. I took the high stair, you know. I don't like the children. We call it the children's. I never had a problem with it, but uh, I'm walking down, and I'm looking down, and I see these central casting people, a general, another general, a colonel, a staff sergeant could be in any movie. These guys, it's like perfect. They're like perfect individuals. If I were casting a movie on the military, I would pick these guys. There's nobody you could hire in Hollywood that looks like this. So I walked down, and this is where I met General Raisin Kane. And what's your name, General? What's your name? And he gave me his name. What's your name, Sergeant? He goes, sir, and I love you, sir. I think you're great, sir. I'll kill for you, sir. <laughs> then he puts on a Make America Great Again hat. You're not allowed to do that, but they did it. I remember I went into the hangar, and there were a lot of there were hundreds of troops. 
and they're not supposed to do this, but they all put on the Make America Great Again hat. Right? <laughs> not supposed to do it. I said, you're not supposed to do that. You know that. They said, it's okay, sir. We don't care. We don't care. And I met these people, and I said, uh, so what do you think, General Sir? Would you like to rest up? See, this is before Biden. See, if I had Biden, I'd say, I'm not Biden. But we didn't know how bad he would be because we hadn't been tested yet. Sir, I said, uh, he said, would you like to rest up for a little while? Then we'll have a meeting. We're all set. And this place is like all bunkers. No windows, no nothing. It's all bunkers, real stark, but in beautiful in a certain way. Billions and billions of dollars they cost many years ago. And I said, uh, no, I'm okay, General. Let's get the business. He was probably surprised. So we started. I say, so General uh, Mattis and all these guys are telling me back in Washington that it'll take four or five years to defeat ISIS. Why? So it's not true, sir. It's not true. I said, what's not true? We can do it very quickly. How quickly? Four weeks, sir. Wait a minute. I was told four years, and you might not be able to. Sir, we can have it done in four weeks. Why? How? What were they doing? Sir, it's our job as a soldier. When they come in from Washington, they're a higher rank. We respect them. We have to respect them. It's our job. I understood exactly what he was saying. He said, sir, when they come in, they tell us what to do, and we do it. I say, don't you question what they say. No, sir, we don't question. They came in. They had a plan, and we said we'd do that plan. What was wrong with the plan? We attacked from way far away, sir, in only one place. It happened to be here. We're hundreds of miles away. By the time the planes got there, they practically had to go back and refuel. I said, what would you do, General? You don't mind if I tell you, sir, do you? I said, I don't mind. I'm waiting to hear. He said, sir, we have auxiliary ports, and we have runways all over the place. They're portables. We call them portables. We put them up faster. We take them down even faster. And they're damn good, sir. What I'd do is I'd hit them from nine different locations. I'd hit them from the left. Now he's getting excited. <laughs> I'd hit them from the right. I'd hit them from up top. I'd go right the hell under the damn ground. I almost used to call it. I would have been in trouble. I would have been in trouble with the religious right, but they love me, so I don't care. <laughs> I would have been a bit. Please don't do that, sir. I would have been by just so proud of myself, I was able to stop it. But I'd hit him from the left, I'd hit him from the right, I'd hit him from east and west and north and south, sir. They would, sir, they would be over very quickly. I said, well, why didn't they do it before? Because, sir, some of the ports and some of these runways are located in countries where they didn't want to be politically incorrect and use a runway and attack the enemy and their savages, sir, attack them from certain points. I said, so you'd attack them, and you'd hit them hard, right? Yes, sir, I'd hit them so hard. And I said, and it would take you four weeks, maybe more, maybe less, sir. So I said, you got to be kidding. I said, I'm going to go back to Washington, and I'm going to think about this, because nobody ever told me about this, because Sir, we'll have time left over. So I go back to Washington, and I call, and just spoke once more. Are you sure you can do this? Yeah, we can do it, sir. I'm, I'm telling you, sir, because we have the greatest military in the world. You know, you see these clowns, these stupid people with Afghanistan. You see these stupid people, Matt, from Afghanistan, the withdrawal, the worst, most embarrassing moment in our lives. They take the military out first. I knew Abdul. I said, Abdul, you'll get hit so hard. 18 months, we didn't have one soldier killed in Afghanistan. I was the one that got the, I was the one that had it ready. It was enough, 21 years, that was enough. It was ridiculous, but I would have never let Bagram go because Bagram is one hour away from where China makes their nuclear weapons, and they let it go. They left at the dark of night. They left the dogs behind, and they left the lights on. And you know who occupies it now? China. So. I said, Sir Raisin, how's it going? He said, Sir, it's just about over, sir. We're going to save a little time, sir. And I said, All right, good, call me. So he does his thing. I get a call that 
ISIS is on the run. The next day I get a call that ISIS is really in bad shape. Next day I get a call that they're surrounded. Next day I speak to somebody and I say, uh, is it really going that well? Sir, it's a miracle. It's not a miracle. It's our military. It's our great military. We have people that know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> and, and they say, sir, we have them now totally surrounded. Most of them are gone, but there's a large group. Uh, just give us the word. Give us the word for what? Don't forget, I had never done this stuff before, you know. I grew up in New York doing real estate deals, really good ones, as you found out. You know, you find out. <laughs> even though they want to take as much money as they can away from me. I think we're going to fine him $450 million. Let's give him a fine. You know, you usually get a $500 fine. I get a $500 million fine. These people are sick. It's all part of weaponization, and it can't be allowed to happen. But I said, uh, what are you talking about? We have, sir, a large group, and we're ready to extinguish them. We're ready to send them to hell. I said, we're talking about human beings, General, you know, naively. She's laughing. We're talking about human beings. No, they're not human. Sir, these are animals. These aren't human beings. These are animals. I said, well, maybe if you fly over them with those incredible, thunderous planes, the greatest planes in the world, maybe you'll shake them up a little bit and they'll surrender. Sir, they don't know what a white flag is. I remember that statement. They don't know about surrendering, sir. They're horrible, horrible people, but they are brave. They're not going to be surrendered. Well, let's try it. Two days, fly over them back and forth, low as hell. Well, we got a couple of bullet holes in our planes, but we'll do it if you want. Just give it a shot. Get a call back two days later. Sir, they're not going to surrender. They've been doing it now for two days, back and forth, back and forth. Give me the order, sir. I said, you got the order. Thank you, sir. A day later, I get a call. We have defeated 100% of ISIS. Isn't that a great story? Isn't that a great story? Right, Mike? 100% of ISIS. One hundred percent of ISIS is gone. So, you know, get, doing stories like that probably Matt, probably I won't get the best speaker this year because I went off this stupid teleprompter, but maybe <laughs> we're wrong. So it was an amazing thing, and I learned so much. I tell that story sometimes rarely because it's, you know, it's a rough story. But I tell it because you have to know what a great military we have if you let them do their jobs. And <laughs> I, I equate it with our police and law enforcement people. We have the greatest law enforcement people in the world, but they, they're not allowed to do their job. It's the same exact thing. <laughs> Chicago could be solved in one day. New York could be solved in a half a day. The New York police, I grew up with them. They're the greatest people. A lot of them have left, and they've gone down to other states, and they've retired. But you have great people. And they can do their job if they're allowed to do their job, but they don't want to lose their pension. They don't want to lose everything. When you see these department stores where 300, 400, usually kids walk in there with the masks on and rob the store, destroy the store, millions of dollars, then the store closes, the whole thing starts to collapse, the city. I could solve that problem in one day, in one hour, in one minute. When the word got out that we took a very tough action, when kids walk out with television sets, like brand new, beautiful, $2,000 television sets, and they're walking out, and the police are told, stand down, don't do anything. If the police would be allowed to do their job, and they would do it really strongly, it would end. That whole phenomena would end immediately. It would never happen again. You don't even have to do it in every city. All you have to do is do it in one. That's why I'm giving immunity to police so that they stop crime, because they don't want to get sued. They don't want to lose their wife their family, their pension, their house would stop immediately. So when I equate the military story and I talk about what they did and how we defeated ISIS, it's the same exact thing for the police. We have the greatest police. They could stop it in Los Angeles. They could stop it in New York. They could stop it in Chicago. They could stop it everywhere. But they're not allowed to do their job. And if they do their job, they lose everything. They lose their pensions, their house. They lose their family. 
But we're not going to let that happen anymore because our city's all run by Democrats, radical left Democrats for the most part, but Democrats. Uh, it's a cesspool. It's a cesspool. Okay, now we go back to one little final story that I have to tell you. So as you remember, the President of Mexico sent a representative <laughs> Lou. See, they'll say he rambled. He's cognitively impaired. No, it's really the opposite. It's total genius. You know that. It is. It's total genius. These fakers up there, he rambled on endlessly, telling these horrible and very boring stories. No, they're very informative stories. They're very important stories, actually. But no, that's, uh, there's no cognitive problem. If there was, I'd know about it. In fact, if there was, you'll be the first to know, because I will tell you. I will tell you. But uh, so what happens is I'm talking to the gentleman, and he's very confident. And I said, no, nope, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. And he thought this is a weird conversation because he kept saying no. I said, no, you're going to do it. <laughs> 100%. Don't even think about it. No, I said no. But, sir, I said no. How many times do I have to say no? I said, say yes. And he said, I can't do that. I said, here's what I'm doing. It's Friday evening, starting Monday morning at 7 o'clock. Mexico is going to pay a tariff of 25% on all of the cars that you stole from our country, by the way. You know, they stole 32% of our manufacturing cars. The United Auto Workers are going to vote for me, all those people, because that deal they made with China. All electric cars. The all-electric mandate. Everybody has to have an electric car, which doesn't go far. It's got a couple of problems. Does it go far? Does it work in cold weather? Remember? Four weeks ago, I won in the largest margin times two history in Iowa. And it was 40 degrees below zero on election night. 40 degrees. This was serious cold. If I walked from here to here, let's say that's five yards, I was freezing my ass off by the time I got there. <laughs> this was so cold. You never saw so many electric cars pulled over to the side of the road. You could have had any one of them. I don't know what the hell the people did. I guess they saved them in some way. But no, they don't go far. And these are the people we have making decisions. No, we want to have everything. We want to have choice. Like in school, we want to have choice. And with cars, we want to have choice, right? You know? We want hybrid. So I said, I'm going to sign this document. And at 7 o'clock on Monday morning, Everything, including cars. And by the way, Mexico is our number one trading partner. Can you? Who the hell knew that? Can you imagine? Mexico is our biggest trading partner. And you know why? Because I put so many tariffs on China that they really had to pull back. And we saved a lot of businesses. We saved the steel industry because of it. But Mexi Mexico is our biggest trading partner. I said, you're going to pay 25% tax or tariff, call it whatever you want. It's similar, but not actually. And you're going to pay it on every single thing that comes in from Mexico into the United States. And like every other country, they rip us off, too. So we don't have any good deals. I changed the South Korea deal. I changed the Japan deal. I, I could sit down and do nothing but change deals. I said, who the hell negotiated for the United States? And then you wonder why we have a $2 trillion deficit. Now, if you look at it now, it's gotten to a level that nobody can even believe. It's so bad under Biden. But I said, that's what's going to happen. And that's going to be a hell of a lot more than 28,000 soldiers. And I'm OK with it. But I'm ready to sign it. You just tell me when to sign it. Sure. May I? Uh... Now it's he's, now he's doing it. He was a very confident man just moments before. Now he's grabbing his collar. He's pulling. I can't believe it. Sir, may I, uh... may I call our president, please? Absolutely. Please give him my warmest regard. And uh, I said, would you make it quick? I'm late. I got the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax to take care of. <laughs> so, I got to take care of that hoax, Mike. So make it quick. I don't have much time. Think of what I could have done if I didn't have to go through all that bullshit, right? <laughs> Think of how good I would have been. So, 
So he comes back in five minutes, and he said, Sir, I'm pleased to tell you that it would be our great honor to supply you with 28,000 soldiers free of charge. It would be our great honor to adhere to your request for remain in Mexico. Millions of people to stay in our country. Here's a guy. You ever see what happened to Tijuana? It was like people. They had no earth left. It was you look down it became, I think it was the fastest growing city in history. Tijuana. Nice place. But we have I said, what about catch and release in Mexico? Yes, sir, we'd love to have you release people that you catch prisoners and murderers. We think it would be a wonderful thing for our country, sir. We would love it. Sir, you can do whatever the hell you want. And we got everything. And then this fool, this stupid fool, released Mexico of all of these obligations. And then last week, for the first time, I can't even believe it, I heard Mexico saying, we're not going to negotiate with the United States unless they give us $10 billion. These are stupid people. How about the hostages? The hostages with Iran? Yes. But the hostages, we gave Iran $6 billion for five people. Six billion. Six billion! For five people. A hiker. You know, a hiker goes over and says, oh, look, there's Iran. Let's go hiking. We give them a billion dollars to get the hiker out. We gave them six billion, and then we gave 10 billion because they supplied some electricity to Iraq. What the hell do we care if they supply it to Iraq? Iraq, should have never, remember I used to say a long time ago, don't go into Iraq, don't do it. But I was only a civilian, so I didn't get that much press. I said, don't go into Iraq, but if you're going to do it, keep the oil. Do you remember I used to say that all the time? Keep the oil, but don't do it, but keep the oil. Iraq now, has $300 billion. Iran has $224 billion. And Iran controls 100% Iraq. So for years, they'd fight each other, and they were the same. For years and years, under different names, but religious thing. But they would fight each other for years, and they, go, they were the two powers, and they were checkmating each other. So they'd fight and fight and fight four or five years. They'd throw a little gas. They'd throw another one, we'll throw a little, and then all of a sudden they say, Shh. and they'd go back, and the border basically remained unchanged. <laughs> this has been going on for, for centuries. And then we come along and we blow up one other side. We blow up Iraq. And now Iran is taking over Iraq. So Iran, they might as well change the name. So Iran has their 200 and some odd billion dollars that they all made in two and a half years. Two and a half years. I told China, and I told all of the countries, France, everybody, I said, listen, if you buy one barrel of oil from Iran, we're not going to do any business. We're going cold turkey, which wouldn't have been a bad thing anyway. We're going cold turkey. You're not going to do it. And we're going to put a 100% tariff on anything that gets through. And President Xi, I told him this. He said, all right, uh, well, we won't do it. <laughs> we won't do it. They didn't buy. By the way, they're buying billions and billions of dollars worth of oil right now. But China didn't buy. Nobody bought. Iran was broke. And they had no money for Hamas. And they had no money for Hezbollah. They had no money for anything. They were down to almost nothing. And there were a lot of stories that Iran had was unable, and all these terror groups were angry at Iran because they weren't paying them. And the terror groups were all breaking up. If I were president, Israel would have never been attacked, would have never been attacked. As soon as, as soon as I was forced out with a rigged election, and we can never let that happen again. Don't let it happen again. Don't let it happen again. As soon as I was forced out with this rigged election, Biden took the sanctions off. Iran went back to levels that they've never seen before, more than they've ever done. And now they're rich as hell. They're selling oil to everybody. They're making so much money, they don't know what to do. They're a very rich nation. With me, they were broke. They were broke. I remember a Democrat congressman on Deface the Nation a couple of weeks. I think it was Deface the Nation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Donald Trump on Deface the Nation. It is Deface the Nation, because the news is so fake. But he was saying that 
Or whether you like Trump or not, he did break Iran. They were broke. They had no money. I said, that's nice of him. He probably, you know, lost his chairmanship or whatever he was. But uh, we did a great job. We did a great job. So what happened is Mexico agreed to all of these things. We took the money out of the military. We built the wall. We had the safest border in the history of our country. The history of our country. And you know, it was very interesting because we built the wall, but a lot of people were coming up at the beginning. Once they saw that I meant business, once they heard some of these stories that I'm telling you right now, they didn't come. They weren't coming. The caravans were much smaller. The people trying to get in was a much easier situation to handle. When you have an idiot like Gavin Newsom saying, if you come up, we're going to give you pension funds. You're going to have pensions. You're going to, we'll give you a mansion. You ever see the things that he's promising? Free health care, free education. Who the hell wouldn't? I may move there myself, actually. No, but people all over the world are hearing this, that California, look, a lot of people think Gavin Newsom is going to run. In a certain way, I hope so. I hope so. Because he's destroyed California. He's destroyed it. But he's got a hell of a line of crap. I watched him on Sean Hannity, who's a good man, Sean. Sean, we love you very much, Sean, if you happen to be watching, which you will. But he was on Sean Hannity, and he was saying, no, no, California's never done better, ba, 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 we got to do this, we're doing that, we're doing that. I'm saying, wait a minute, the place is failing. They don't have water. They're notifying people in Beverly Hills, you can only use 40 gallons of water. They don't have water. By the way, they could have so much water. I had it all set. All of the federal government approvals were done. All he had to do was sign a little piece of paper. And I won't let him get away with that again, because he had to sign one piece of paper, and water would be pouring down from up north, pouring down from Canada. And the, you know, it comes down the artificial veins and the, the, the natural veins where the water poured down. They take this water and they send it out to the Pacific, way above California. They send the water out to the Pacific to protect a little tiny fish that's not doing too well anymore. And people don't have water, and the farmland is barren. You go down, the best land there is in the whole country, they can't farm it because they have no water. And it's true. In Beverly Hills, you pay a fortune in taxes. They say you can only brush your teeth once a day. Who the hell wants to mean you can't use too much water on your hair? That would, that would put me out. I would, I would not want to be. They put restrictors on showers. They put restrictors on faucets. You buy brand new faucets. Aren't they beautiful, darling? Oh, yes, look at them. Beautiful brass faucets. They're so beautiful. Let's try them. Oh, shit, no water's coming now. Yeah. Drop. It drops out. You turn on the shower. I'm going to take a shower tonight. My hair's going to look better than it ever looked. I get that whole deal ready, I'm all set to go. Turn on the shower, ding, ding. No, and they have so much water. I said to some of our great congressmen that asked me to help them with a the problem up in that area, up north in California, I said, I see you have a drought. They said, no, we don't have a drought. We have so much water, you don't know what to do. But they send it out to the Pacific. Uh, we're not going to let them get away with that any longer. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And frankly, I believe, you know, I gave, a, I gave a speech up there. We had like 100,000 people show up. I said, what the hell is going on over here? I always hear Republicans can't win. California, you can't win. I will tell you, if God came down and God was the vote checker, I believe we would win California. I think it's so crazy. They send out 36 million ballots get sent out to people unknown. They're sent out all over the place. How many people from California know people that got six, seven, eight ballots, okay? Our elections are so corrupt. I think we'd do very well. I think I would do very well in California, actually. And uh, I think I would do well in a lot of places because it's common sense. Remember, not conservative, it's common sense. I'm conservative, but the word is com the words are common sense. Our country is run by people that are destroying it. We're not going to let it happen again. We're going to have a great military. We're going to have a great every, — everything in our country is going to function properly again. It's going to function well. We're going to be respected all over the world. 
We're going to be respected like we've never been respected before. And it won't take long. It's like Orban said, come hungry. Put Trump back in, and the whole world is going to be fixed. He said that very strongly. Put Trump back in. What do you do? They said, what do you do, sir? What do you do? The world is blowing up. He said, it's a very simple solution. Put President Trump back in office. It will all be healed very, very quickly. So I want to uh, apologize for literally not repeating this beautiful speech. But I thought some of these stories are instructive because they tell you our military is great. They tell you our law enforcement is great. They tell you our president is incompetent. They tell you a lot of things, some of which you knew and some of which you didn't know. So now I'm going to the place I'm supposed to be. I'm going to South Carolina. I'm supposed to be there. And if I do poorly, I'm going to blame, I'm going to blame Mercedes. Forget about that. I'm going to blame Mercedes. Because I am supposed to be there, and I'm not there. And if I do poorly, I'm blaming everybody in this audience. But I think we're going to do OK. And I just want to thank everybody. And ladies and gentlemen, for those of you from a beautiful place called South Carolina, go out and vote right now, please. Get in those cars and drive fast. I'm going to leave you with this one final message. We're going to win the election. We're going to win it big. We're going to win it bigger than ever before. We're going to do things that nobody believed. It's going to be more important even than 2016. We are going to make 